Hello, welcome to RoboHub. Could you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Oleg Shripitko. I'm a CTO of a company called Evo Cargo. Welcome, Oleg. Can you tell us more about your background? Yeah, sure. So I'm personally uh, finished my bachelor degree in electrical engineering and then switched to masters in space science and technologies. And while studying there, I organized a team of roboticists to compete in Eurobot competition, which is one of the biggest worldwide uh, robotics competitions for mobile robots. So during the first year, we took the 16th place on the worldwide. And then next year, we took the fifth place. And that's where my robotics uh, path started, basically. And can you tell us about your journey to Evocargo and the general motivation for the creation of the company? Sure. So basically, Evo Cargo is a vertically integrated logistics provider. And of course, the main thing about Evo Cargo is that we provide logistics service with autonomous vehicles and autonomous trucks. Uh, so we started as a team uh, like three or four years ago. And the first project we accomplished was actually on a, a public transportation. So we created an autonomous bus for people transportation. But then it turned out that there is no niche for such business. And we started looking for a new niche and uh, found out that logistics is the big thing because at that moment, many companies were looking for some solutions to optimize uh, freight uh, logistics. And that is why we pivoted into logistics and built our first, uh, tr first truck which was capable of moving one and a half tons of uh, payload. And since, since then, uh, we started developing different logistics solutions, both for enclosed territories and for public roads. And that is what Evocargo is doing now. Cool. To understand like more about the logistics and transportation field, what are some like existing solutions or approaches that these companies are going for when transporting payloads? And how does your technology kind of bring in uh, like new opportunities? Mm -hmm. So currently companies are using uh, common vehicles, uh, both small and big trucks to transport goods inside some huge logistics centers or factories and uh, between such centers uh, and between factories. Uh, so usually it takes a lot of time to load and unload cargo and also the process is not really transparent uh, and uh, apart from uh, some things which are digitalized already, for example, documents uh, and things like that, uh, there is not much which is automated in logistics at the moment. Of course, there are some uh, smart hubs where we already can see robots. Uh, but in general, there is a huge niche in operational logistics. And by operational logistics, we mean the goods moving inside some big logistics uh, complexes where you always need to move one part uh, from one building to another. Uh, so this is a big thing to automate and uh, there is no solution currently at the market for this process. Uh, let's talk more about your specific technology. Can you tell us about how you can build an autonomous truck from scratch? Mm -hmm. uh, so the Evo Cargo has two main products. One is a, what is called N1 class vehicle, which is capable of carrying one and a half tons uh, of uh, goods. And this vehicle we indeed built from scratch. So we have an engineering team which developed the vehicle uh, for autonomy on the first place. And it allows us to optimize sensors positions, uh, also to make the solution uh, cheaper than existing vehicles because we could um, build it without uh, systems uh, such as steering wheel and driver's seat. Uh, and we also uh, optimize power consumption, which is really important for logistics because you want your vehicle to move as much uh, goods as possible on a single charge. Uh, so uh, we undertook many iterations to get what we get now with our vehicle. Uh, so if, for instance, in our first prototypes, you had to disassemble the whole vehicle to switch some fuse or something like this. But since then we improved uh, the design a lot and now the vehicle itself is easy to maintain uh, and uh, easy to operate. 
And most components for our vehicles are standard automotive components. So you basically can uh, assemble car at any point in the world where you can buy standard automotive components. Uh, and it is easy to fix because of that. And uh, regarding autonomous trucks we are building, which are class N3, uh, we took a different path. Uh, it would took us a lot of time to design a truck from a scratch. That is why we found industrial partner, which is leading uh, in the industry. And we started developing from existing platform, just adding to this uh, autonomous capabilities, sensors and uh, onboard computers. So these two projects have different approaches uh, because of time scale, we want to be on the market with them. I see. So what kind of sensing and algorithms are used for these two projects? Mm -hmm. So if we are talking about smaller cars, uh, since they operate on enclosed facilities, we believe that this problem can be solved with computer vision purely. That is why our small vehicles are equipped with cameras and majority of algorithms are working on them are using uh, visual sensors as an input. Uh, we have both visual navigation, which can recognize buildings, different objects, uh, other road participants, uh, linear markings, and so on. Of course, we are also using GNSS sensors for global positioning and all other standard kinds of sensors. If we are talking about bigger vehicles, the safety and speed requirements are much higher. That is why there we apply also LIDARs for object detection and road recognition. In the smaller vehicles, sorry. In the smaller vehicles, from the very beginning, uh, we had to think about final customer. And that is why uh, LIDARs, uh, as an expensive sensors, uh, would increase the cost of the platform itself a lot. That is why we tried to make these platforms as cheap as possible. And also, as I said, because of uh, small uh, speeds requirements uh, and smaller dynamics on the roads in enclosed facilities, this problem can be solved with cameras as we believe. Okay. So what kind of speeds are we talking about? And are there additional safety considerations even for the enclosed facilities? Mm -hmm. uh, so the hour speed of the vehicle is 20 kilometers per hour on enclosed facility. And user, usually there is a limit on which you can move inside such facilities. Uh, apart from speeds, uh, of course, there are many safety requirements uh, to the vehicle. Uh, it should uh, have, uh, Send, uh, it should have like uh, it should not have blind spots around it. It also should be convenient to work with uh, with all uh, participants of logistics process, loaders, and other stuff. Uh, so that is why we have other sensors apart from cameras. We use Parktronics to make uh, the start and stop operations of the vehicle safe. We also have sound signals to make people know that vehicle is going to move or stop. And for the, the larger vehicles, um, do you have other sensors in addition to LIDARs? And what are the main considerations there? Mm -hmm. So uh, there are many challenges uh, on trucks. Uh, for instance, they're moving with a higher speed, much higher than classical autonomous cars in the city center. Uh, so the sensing range should be much higher. That is why apart from LIDARs, we also use cameras for longer ranges. We use radars, inertial measurement systems for positioning, and of course, GPS receivers to know globally where we are. Are there any specific challenges to autonomous trucks versus autonomous uh, cars? Yes, yeah, there are a lot. So as I said, the higher speeds is a uh, great challenge. Uh, also, the trucks themselves are much heavier, which means uh, longer braking distances and other dyna dynamics compared to conventional cars. Uh, so trucks also are uh, multi-rigid bodies, which means the center of mass is changing depending on how you're loading your truck. And it also has mm -hmm. to be uh, accounted when you're developing path planning and control algorithms. Uh, so also drive-by-wire 
technology, which is standard now in uh, cars, uh, is still a rare feature for trucks. That is why you have to come up with a sophisticated system of control of such vehicle. Can you elaborate more on what you mean by drive-by-wire? Mm -hmm. So in classical car, you can just uh, plug the onboard computer into a uh, CAN bus of the vehicle and you can read and send commands to it. Uh, so you can know how your steering wheel is turned, on which angle it is turned, uh, what is the current vehicle speed, and you can also control all uh, mechatronics of the car. In uh, trucks, sometimes some components are not electrical, and that is why you have to come up with some other feedback uh, systems to read uh, how your steering wheel is turned or with which speed you are moving currently. So with all those additional challenges and requirements, you mentioned earlier stage, there's iterations of your design. In general, can you describe what kind of testing or evaluation are used and how do you make decisions about each part of your vehicle? Mm -hmm. So we have many stages of testing. First of all, uh, we started working with customers as early as it was possible and we started gaining a lot of feedback about the vehicle design, how it should look like, uh, how it should move inside uh, logistics centers and so on. Uh, as for testing, we have both simulations where we check all of our algorithms starting from perception and ending with control algorithms and also we have our vehicles tested on uh, specific uh, test scenarios uh, we have a, a test facility close to our office where we can simulate different scenarios uh, we have different types of infrastructure such as road signs uh, traffic lights and so on to simulate uh, scenarios uh, vehicle can encounter and see how it behaves itself. And also we can run different experiments with hardware, seeing how long it takes to car, for car to discharge, how many kilometers it goes with some specific uh, cargo and so on. So in terms of the algorithm that the vehicles use when making decisions, can you describe on a high level on that? Mm -hmm. Okay, I will try. So it all starts with the perception. As I said, in smaller cars, we have uh, cameras which can recognize road participants and different road infrastructure. Uh, then the vehicle uh, tries to determine where it is uh, related to the road, different road participants, uh, which is called localization. Uh, then we estimate how uh, different objects are moving uh, on the road and trying to predict where, we'll, where they will be in some moments of time. And based on this information, we plan our path uh, in order to avoid collisions and also have some safety margin uh, for our motion. And then we send control signals to uh, motors and steering uh, actuators in order to uh, accomplish the trajectory we planned. How much of this is uh, facility specific or is this a general framework that will apply across a variety of scenarios? Mm -hmm. So we now operate on a typical facilities which are not are undertaking any changes before our car is deployed there. However, we still assess how facility uh, looks like before uh, deploying the vehicle. For instance, uh, we face different weather conditions. Sometimes there are lighting problems uh, on the particular facilities and so on. So we have a as a first step at, at any project, we have su such assessment where we uh, see how facility is applicable for, for the vehicle and vehicle is applicable for the facility. And also we build a digital map of any facility we have to deploy in, uh, in order for the car to know uh, where it should localize itself and how this uh, facility looks like. So you previously mentioned the need for optimizing for power. So can you talk about your team's choice of going with electric vehicles? Mm -hmm. uh, so we really believe that uh, electric cars are the future because they're more uh, uh, ecological friendly and more sustainable. Uh, also, we see that uh, um, infrastructure is 
sl uh, slowly becoming ready for deployment of such cars everywhere. Uh, it really has high impact on cost of our solution because it makes our car much cheaper for the customer in comparison with uh, conventional uh, combustion and engine uh, vehicles. We also work on a hydrogen uh, vehicles uh, to make it even more, uh, even cheaper for our customer. So we also as a team, we have a strong experience in developing electric vehicles because part of the team, uh, which was uh, on the initial stages of the project, which uh, organized Evercarga, had a strong background developing electric motors. That is why we have our uh, special patented electric war uh, motor in our vehicles. Uh, so yeah, that's basically it. So what uh, distance? can you run on for one charge or refueling? Mm -hmm. On a single charge, the car is going up to 250 kilometers, which is uh, usually enough for the typical facility to work the whole day. Uh, and if the range extension is needed, we can also install a secondary battery pack in our vehicles to even extend the range more. And in terms of uh, infrastructure, specifically with hydrogen stations, uh, where are you deployed now? And you, do you see the growing in infrastructure being any of the challenges in the near future? Yeah, if you're talking about hydrogen fuel cells, uh, this is still a developing technology and that is why there are infrastructure issues. However, we see that the governments of many countries are investing a lot uh, to grow such infrastructure. Uh, we believe that uh, hydrogen fuel cells as a range extender uh, can be a great solution for trucks which have to travel on longer distances because on, on pure electricity you either have to carry the whole truck of batteries or the uh, distance you can travel will be much shorter than for a conventional truck. So for trucks, hydrogen is a good solution. Of course, we are still limited with infrastructure, but we see that uh, hydrogen uh, refueling stations are uh, appearing slowly in all countries. So I believe that in future, uh, this will be the model for all uh, autonomous and not only autonomous trucks. Cool. Let's talk about the logistics and like operation side of the company. So mm -hmm. how does the customer approach your team um, to get an evaluation of their abilities to use one of your autonomous trucks in their facilities? And what do what are the main needs of the customers that you, your team sees? Mm -hmm. So we see that many logistics companies are striving for solution to uh, make their logistics more efficient uh, and more transparent. Uh, apart from transporting goods, uh, our vehicles gather a lot of data and based on this data we can provide really deep insights for our customers on uh, how their goods are moving, where they're going, how often the car is waiting for, uh, for being loaded, and so on. Uh, and also there are many uh, big logistics companies which are concerned with the carbon footprint and for that solution of Evercargo also meets their requirements to be ecological. Uh, so Yes, and as I said, using electrical cars and cars specifically designed to be autonomous, we can be really cost efficient for our customers. And that's, of course, the first thing the customer is looking for. So do the customers, uh, would they purchase your vehicles for their facilities? Uh, no, as a fleet manager, we also we, we are not selling our cars, but providing the whole service. So we're deploying vehicles, we're making sure they're operational during the whole deployment time and operation time. We also have a, a thing called a dispatching center where our dispatcher can monitor the state of the vehicle and how they operate. And uh, in case of emergency, he also can interrupt the operation because he receives uh, the real-time video stream for the, from the vehicle and all the telemetry data. So a full package logistics service for your customers. Yep. What type of uh, feedback have you received or are there any current or next step directions that your team is pursuing? 
Yeah, as I said, we are constantly working with customers to see how uh, our vehicle uh, can be improved. Uh, so now we are developing several models of our vehicles already uh, regarding small vehicles because there are different logistics and needs. And sometimes when, for example, you are transporting uh, not classical goods, not classical palletized goods. You need specific uh, infrastructure on the vehicle to fix the good and, and so on. Uh, and the, as for the next plans, we're planning to deploy uh, many vehicles on the single uh, logistics center next year. Uh, so currently we had like couple uh, of vehicles on a single territory and next big step for us is uh, to have tens of vehicles on a single territory being operational at the same time. I see and they'll be in communication with one another. Yeah through the dispatching center I mentioned previously. What about the um, the larger autonomous trucks what's the current status on that project and project? Mm -hmm. Yes, so we will release the first uh, vehicle of such type next year uh, and we will start tests uh, and we'll again gather feedback on how they operate and of course we will work to continuously improve the technology. But the next big step for us for the next year is to deploy first couple of these vehicles and uh, gather the data to improve, improve even further this technology. Will they be operating, will they need special uh, logistics or operational infrastructure for the larger vehicles, such as special lanes or others? Mm -hmm. All uh, As all of our vehicles, we always build them to be fully autonomous. So mm -hmm. we're not expecting any communication or road infrastructure being built specifically for our vehicles. So we try to use current existing infrastructure and to make cars as autonomous as possible, uh, not being coupled with any infrastructure issues. I see. It's very exciting. Looking forward to hearing more uh, updates on Avocargo. Yeah, well, that's all the time we have. Thanks again. It was Thank great to speak much. with you. And that's it for today. As always, simply go to robohop.org forward slash podcast for loads more exciting episodes, news and views about robotics. And if you have any feedback for us here at the podcast, we're always happy to hear from our listeners. Whether you have a question, want to suggest someone to interview, or maybe would like to get involved with our team, simply email our president Abate at abate.demey at robohub.org. We'll be back in about two weeks' time. Until then, goodbye.